he gets there. The alternative media, Jerry. That's where you hear the truth. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. You are listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, March 24th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Giving you a look at the media industrial complex on this Friday. I hope you're doing well, and we really appreciate you joining us, and we really appreciate you supporting our work. We've talked about the Masonic masterpiece of Bon Iver, his 22 A Million album, and we also talked about the album Patterns of Light from long-running Detroit band His Name is Alive inspired by and essentially commissioned by the Large Hadron Collider. Why does a weird scientist want space rock bands to basically create these ritualistic music? Is it, is, <laughs> is it something they can't figure out how to do themselves and they need bands to do it? So each month we are doing what we call an album analysis. And you know I buy a lot of records. I buy some used records. I pretty much have to limit myself to one trip to the record store a month just to make sure I stay inside budget, because we do have some rad record stores here in Portland. And I was, you know, I picked up some some jazz records. They were new to me. And you know the inner sleeves sometimes from record labels that are kind of generic and just have pictures of all the other records they were selling at the time? And it looks not unlike the old Columbia House things with all the little small pictures of album covers. So I'm flipping through some new acquisitions, and something catches my eye, and I see the name Rothschilds. The musical? Are you kidding me? I immediately went on Discogs, immediately looked it up and said, oh, well, this has got to be probably expensive. I've never heard of this thing. It's it's probably got to be pretty rare. Seven eighty eight. I got it, including shipping. It's in my hands. Now, I was going to hit the air last night and basically play the album for you so you could have it. I still have that recording, and I actually have both sides already published to the website. I didn't stream it last night, but I had made a recording when I got the record in. What I discover is this is hidden in plain sight, hidden right in public view. Not only did it cost seven bucks to get, but wouldn't you know it, the entire musical is on YouTube. Piece by piece by piece. What they don't have, however, is the physical copy of the album that I am holding in my hands for you right here. And what I want to do, in the amount of time I can do it, is read, and this is another thing we love about the older records, there actually used to be information on the records. <laughs> Liner notes. The Rothschilds, a musical. For the last 150 years, the history of the House of Rothschild has been, to an amazing extent, the backstage history of Western Europe. So Frederick Morton prefaced... His family portrait, The Rothschilds, upon which Jerry Bach, Sheldon Harnick, and Sherman Yellen based their 1970 musical, The Rothschilds. The name now gleams of gold and uncounted treasures. It booms out a tale of monumental wisdom and success. Once, 200 years ago, it was harshly different. When the Rothschild dynasty began in Frankfurt, there were walled-in ghettos for Jews and uncompromising bigots in power. There was a struggle for survival and dim hope. For most Jews, there was only a half-hearted dream of a future. For Mayor Rothschild, there was a belief, a determination, a conviction. The Rothschilds are brought to life by Jerry Bach and Sheldon Harnick, composer and lyricist, and Sherman Yellen, author, a gifted cast, and a host of inspired professional talents. Bach and Harnick collaborated on Fiddler on the Roof. This is their big follow-up to Fiddler on the Roof, which I'm sure you've heard of. Michael Kidd, director and choreographer, five-time Tony winner for Finian's Rainbow, Guys and Dolls, Lil Abner, Destry Rides Again, and Can Can. He also directed Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, Bandwagon, and Hello, Dolly. Then the liner notes get into the breakdown of song by song, story by story. Act 1. The ballroom glitters with the royal and resplendent with courtiers proclaiming their right in grandiloquent style. It is 1772 at the palace of the Prince of Hesse, an assemblage of the right kind of people. They play the song Pleasure and Privilege. At the gate of Frankfurt Ghetto, Mayor Rothschild, played by Hal Linden, returning home from a year of apprenticeship in a Hanover banking house is stopped by a guard. When Mayor is taunted by mischievous kids, the guard shout, Jew, do your duty! The Jew must doff his hat and bow low to his tormentors. 
His baggage is inspected and a tax imposed before Mayer is allowed to enter the ghetto to go home. Gutel, played by Leela Martin, greets Mayer at his house. She's been waiting for him for a year, eager to be married, eager to leave Frankfurt for Hanover. Mayer has other ideas. He has learned much about banking, about money, about himself. They will marry and live here in Frankfurt. Gutel reminds him that only 12 Jewish marriages are permitted each year. They won't be able to marry. Mayer tells her not to worry. Somehow he will get around the quota, and they will reopen the shop to sell goods and a collection of rare coins he has smuggled in. They will be rich. Gatell doesn't want to get rich. She wants to get married. They play the song One Room. Mayer takes his rare coins to the Frankfurt Fair. He's a masterful pitchman, building romantic stories about each coin, exotic legends that end up in profitable sales and attract the greedy interest of his serenity, Prince William of Hesse, played by Keen Curtis, and they play the song that recurs throughout the play... In the musical, he tossed a coin. His success at the fair gains him an invitation to bring his wares to the palace of Prince William. He ingratiates himself to the prince and works out a deal with the prince's secretary, Boudouris, played by Leo Layden. Mayer also tries to bribe the prince to lift the marriage quota. The prince is shocked, but good-humoredly sentences him to the misery he deserves, marriage. Mayer also deals himself into a position as an act, as an act of, to act as agent for the court bankers. He's learning his way around, teaching the court how to make extra profits. He also offers Prince William an alliance with his sons when they are born. Mayer knows he needs his sons to help him, to turn his dreams into reality. He needs sons to join him while there's a world to be won. And they play the song Sons. Five sons are born. Willing workers, obedient learners, sharp traders, eloquent salesmen, the youngsters make their parents proud, but they're confined to the ghetto. Time passes, mobs still break into the Jewish section, burn, pillage, but the family's better prepared. They've built a secret cellar to hide their goods, to hide themselves. The years pass, no longer are they youngsters, now they are young men. Nathan, played by Paul Hecht, Jacob, played by West Virginian Chris Sarandon, that's where Susan gets her last name, you might know him from Fright Night. Amshell, played by Timothy Jerome, Solomon, played by David Garfield, and Kalman, played by Alan Gruet. After each pogrom, the shop is a shambles, but the boys have been through this many times. Despite the hardships, they haven't lost a bit of the ambition they inherited. They're now prepared for the banking business, for life and success outside the ghetto gates, and they mean to get it. They play the song Everything. Mayor takes his sons to Prince William's palace, the prince's cousin, King Christian of Denmark is at war and needs money. Since William feels that loans to relatives degenerate into gifts, he wants unknown bankers to negotiate the loan. Mayer and his sons try to convince the prince that they should handle the details to safeguard his interests and gain him extra profits. He is doubtful. They're too young, too inexperienced, but their chutzpah, nerve, charms him and gains them appointment as court banking agents. They are on their way to Denmark. They play Rothschild and Sons. While they're in Denmark, Hesse falls to Napoleon. When the French take the town, Fouché, played by King Curtis, arrives to demand and collect ransom, and they play the song Allons. The Rothschilds return home to find Prince William has fled, his court abolished. But Mayer has no time for failure. He's still the prince's agent. The sons will collect William's debts throughout Europe, in Vienna, in Prussia, in Prague, in Hamburg. The favorite assignment of establishing the family banking business is lo- in London is given to Nathan. Despite Mama's fears, the five brothers are dispatched to carry out Mayer's plans. And they play a reprise version of Sons, and that is the first act finale. They just, just jump right over that Napoleon part, right? We're reading the liner notes from the back of the Rothschilds, a musical from 1970. It is on, of course, Columbia Records, and it's on Masterworks, which nerds know Masterworks is the sidebar for their classical, for their musical stuff. That gets into the whole history of Columbia Records, and that's the old man who wanted to keep it the old way. And then younger dudes like Clive Davis dragged Columbia kicking and screaming into the rock and roll future. We can talk about all that some other time. Then it's act two, my friends, of Rothschilds, the musical. It's 1805 in London, the Royal Stock Exchange. The French are about to invade England. The market's shaky. Confidence in the country's ability to repulse the attack is weak. They play Give England Strength. 
Nathan arrives, brash, sure of his ability to make good. He forgets Papa's admonition about rumors and supposed inside information that he might overhear. He corresponds in code constantly. But ignoring the warnings, plunges on T. The price plunges too. And they play This Amazing London Town. When he tells his father what he's done, he is told to take his loss, never do anything again without advance information. And with the family spread out across Western Europe, they will set up their own information agency secretly. They can even start their own rumors. It all works. Nathan makes daily killings in the market. Every move he makes is watched, interpreted, misinterpreted. His fortune skyrockets. Mama and Papa are happy, but Mama wants to know if he's found a girl yet. And they play They Say. Hannah Cohen, played by Jill Clayburg, is a rabid do-gooder, comes to the exchange to solicit charity contributions. Nathan gives her charity, but she gives him no hope that she has time for romance, especially his. He's not discouraged. He decides on the spot he will marry her. And they play, I'm in love, I'm in love. Nathan doesn't give up on Hannah. He follows her around London until he catches up with her at her garden. She wants the war ended. A loan by Nathan to England will help. He says it's all up to her. If she promises to marry him, he'll make the loan. If she refuses, she will be guilty of continuing the war. When the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the British Treasury arrives to ask him to make the loan to fight Napoleon, Nathan agrees if the British can persuade Germany and Austria to lift their restrictions on the Jews. Hannah hears it all and says yes. And they reprise, I'm in love, I'm in love. Vienna Falls. Nathan asks his parents to leave the ghetto and come to London to live. They refuse, convinced the ghetto is their home until no ghetto exists. Nathan suggests a deal. A major loan will be made to Prince Metternich of Austria, a notorious despot. In return, they will receive a verbal guarantee that all restrictions on Jews will be lifted. Papa reminds Nathan that such a loan, backed by Metternich's words, is worth less than nothing. Papa and Mama approve of the loan and the marriage. An alliance is set up against Bonaparte. The loans are made and promises received that Jews will be freed as soon as there is victory. The parents are ecstatic. The ghetto walls will come down when the French are beaten. Once it was unborn hope, now it appears to be a reality. And they play In My Own Lifetime. The war is over. Peace and tranquility have come at last. It's 1818. The heads of state will gather at A. La Chapelle to sign the peace treaty. The Rothschilds will be there to witness the granting of justice to the Jews. Even Mayor, aged, infirm, makes the trip. When they arrive at the palace, a grand ball is taking place. Prince Metternich, played by King Curtis, and the other rulers renege on their promise. The Jews will be kept in their place. The establishment will give up nothing. They play, have you ever seen a prettier little Congress? And also stability. Back home in the ghetto of Frankfurt, Mayor still struggles to devise a plan to free his people. He leaves a will. His son shall never divide their wealth. They must make it grow to be used to guarantee equality to bring the walls down. When their father dies, the family gathers at the ghetto birthplace. After the will is read, a family council is held. Papa told them there was no virtue in mankind. They had to do something about it. Do they risk their fortunes to bankrupt Metternich and his ilk? Do they undersell to their last cent? Do they chance leaving their own children destitute? The decision is left to their mother. What does she want? Her answer is simple. Everything. The sons return to their particular bases of operation. They undersell Metternich's peace bonds, cutting, dumping, selling short, selling lower and lower and lower. And finally, the bond market hits bottom. The prince is faced with total national bankruptcy. And they play the song Bonds. The sons are gathered at the Rothschild ghetto home. They know the prince will concede. He has no other choice. They know they've won. The walls will come down. The Jews will be freed. And to ensure the prince's good faith, the Rothschilds insist they be appointed the government's bankers. Their requests are granted, including one final demand by order of Francis I of Austria. Each son is created baron. And at long last, they are invited to dance at the court. Mayor had faith in himself, in his purpose, in his sons. For him, man's greatest need, greatest gift, sons. And they sing the song, The Will. And that is the finale of The Rothschilds, a musical. From the creators of Fiddler on the Roof from 1970. Hidden in plain sight, my friends. You know, when you start to see things and you start to discover things, you're seeing the name everywhere. 
what, on the latest Run the Jewels album, RTJ3, Killer Mike mentions the Rothschilds. Now, I immediately got this record, and it's, and it's audio, to our friend Richard Grove of TragedyandHope.com, who I believe is probably writing the definitive book on the Rothschilds as we speak. So I'd love to talk to him for further information about this musical and the ways that we could analyze it for its truth and lies. Again, we'll put up all those show notes, and you can listen to this entire musical. One, I'll have my own vinyl version published to the website, and I've already sent that out to a couple of you a couple weeks ago. But like I said, the entire thing is on YouTube. Track by track by track. And that playlist will be embedded on our post. Pleasure and Privilege, the Rothschilds musical. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, March 24th, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, giving you news you are not going to hear anywhere else, and hopefully in a fear-free, commercial-free fashion. We've been doing it since 9-11-05, my friends. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.